Now, is that racist? Pretty athletic for a white guy? No, it's not racist. Kevin, you were being funny. Taking things out of context, not cool. Ed Henry, up next, filling in for Shannon Bream. Good night from Washington. Hello and welcome to Fox News at Night. I'm Ed Henry in Washington, in for Shannon Bream tonight on a very busy news night. Breaking tonight, in fact, at this late hour, major developments on two fronts. President Trump making surprise stops this evening in Florida, meeting with survivors and thanking first responders after that horrific school shooting that has gripped the nation. This, as the FBI comes under fire yet again, for admitting it failed to follow up on a tip that virtually predicted this week's Florida school shooting. And GOP members of Congress are demanding answers tonight. Meanwhile, the president declaring vindication after a shocking development in special counsel Robert Mueller's probe, with Mr. Trump saying this shows his campaign did nothing wrong and there's still no collusion. We're all over the continuing fallout, but first, live team coverage tonight from Florida. Phil Keating all over this shocking development within the FBI, but first, Kevin Cork on the unscheduled stops tonight for the president. Good evening, Kevin. Evening there, Ed. A very big night here in South Florida. As you point out, the president not only had a chance to say thank you to the first responders, he also met with some victims of that tragic shooting over at Parkland. Uh, very important for the president to not just be here on the ground and to say thank you, but also to really say something important to the people who not only did all they could to help save those who were affected by that tragedy, but also to pledge to work together with those who would be stakeholders in this community. Very sad something like that could happen. But uh, the job the doctors did, the nurses, the hospital, first responders, law enforcement, really incredible. The speed that they got the victims over to the hospital was like record. In one case, 20 minutes, and one case, 19 minutes from the time of the shot. It's, uh, it's an incredible thing. Just some of the comments from the president on a night when there was certainly no shortage of reaction, uh, marking the heroism of so many over the past few days. And while the visit to Broward North was not on the official schedule today, it is fair to say the president actually tipped his hand just a bit on Twitter when he said he'd be meeting with some of the bravest people on earth and he pledged to also work with Congress. He said uh, he'd be meeting with people whose lives have been totally shattered. In fact, he did meet with stakeholders, including lawmakers, at the Broward County Sheriff's Office tonight, a little round table, a solutions-based approach, say White House officials, to an issue that has torn the very fabric of this community and unfortunately so many others over the past several years. Now tomorrow, Ed, we suspect the president will continue his outreach, trying to touch base with victims of this tragedy and again looking for solutions as his administration reacts to another deadly school shooting. Back You're to you. right. A lot of families in pain tonight. The president trying to comfort them. Kevin, we appreciate you being live with us tonight. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, a stunning revelation in the Florida shooting cases. We noted the FBI admitting today it mishandled a very specific tip about the 19-year-old gunman that could have, could have prevented the horrific event taking place. It, of course, ended up in 17 lives being lost. Correspondent Phil Keening joins us now live with more from the shooting scene in Parkland. Good evening, Phil. Good evening, Ed. Numerous warnings and alarms rang out about the high school shooting suspect Nicholas Cruz over the past few years, but not one of them led to an arrest, a crime, or even a detention. In fact, just in Broward County alone, the sheriff says 20 times his office received a call for service to deal with a volatile kid named Nicholas Cruz. He says such calls in the future will now garner far greater scrutiny. And fresh reports tonight on Florida Department of Children and Family Services documents that in 2016, they investigated Cruz after he cut his hands to bleed on Snapchat and that he indicated he wanted to buy a gun. Well, investigators determined he was not a threat to himself or to others, and they left him in the care of his foster mother. And in a stunning admission today, the FBI admits it failed to properly act on a tip from someone close to Cruz just five weeks ago that he was erratic, desired to kill people, and specifically could carry out a school shooting. That tip was never forwarded down to the Miami field office as it should have been. 
FBI Director Christopher Wray today from Washington, quote, we have spoken with victims and families and deeply regret the additional pain this causes all those affected by this horrific tragedy. That led the U.S. Attorney General to publicly reprimand his own FBI, quote, it is now clear that the warning signs were there and tips to the FBI were missed. We see the tragic consequences of those failures. But even that, exceeded in outrage by Florida's Republican Governor Rick Scott. Quoting here, the FBI's failure to take action against this killer is unacceptable. 17 innocent people are dead and acknowledging a mistake isn't going to cut it. The FBI director needs to resign. Cruz himself remains on suicide watch, held without bond, charged with 17 counts of first-degree murder. One of his public defenders says he's well aware of what he's accused of doing. He's sad, he's mournful, he's remorseful. Um, he is fully aware of what is going on. And he's just a broken human being. And quoting one of the public defenders for Cruz, the Sun Sentinel reporting tonight that Cruz is now willing to plead guilty to all counts, all 17 counts of first degree premeditated murder in order to avoid the death penalty. However, reacting to that, state prosecutors say no such deal is even close to being on the table at this point. And the attorney general has indicated she absolutely favors Cruz being convicted mm. and being sent to Florida's death row. Ed. Wow. A lot happening down there in Florida. A lot here in Washington. Trey Gowdy, the Republican congressman tonight, saying he wants a quick briefing from the FBI to get to the bottom of what went wrong there. Phil Keating, we appreciate you being on top of this tonight. Sure. Now to the unexpected new round of indictments in the Russian meddling investigation of 13 Russians. At least three big takeaways. No Americans were winning participants. It did not impact the election. That according to the Deputy Attorney General. And the 13 Russians who were indicted still have to be extradited by Moscow to face American justice. All of that according to the Justice Department tonight. Our Chief Intelligence Correspondent, Catherine Harrods, has all the details right now. Catherine? The defendants allegedly conducted what they called information warfare against the United States. With direct oversight of the Russia Special Counsel probe, the Deputy Attorney General Ron Rosenstein said 13 Russian nationals and three Russian organizations were charged with, quote, conspiracy to defraud the United States and illegally using social media to divide Americans and disrupt the 2016 presidential election. The Russian conspirators want to promote discord in the United States and undermine public confidence in democracy. As early as 2014, the 37-page indictment alleges the Russian defendants, including Yevgeny Prigozhin, a businessman with deep ties to Russian President Vladimir Putin and their co-conspirators, began planning the operation from their base in St. Petersburg, Russia. The indictment says, quote, by early to mid-2016, defendants' operations included supporting the presidential campaign of then-candidate Donald J. Trump and disparaging Hillary Clinton. The defendants bought server space in the U.S. to create a virtual private network to hide the operation's Russian roots. They used stolen or fictitious American identities, fraudulent bank accounts, and false identification documents. The defendants posed as politically and socially active Americans, advocating for and against particular candidates. The indictment alleges that Russian operatives made contact with members, volunteers, and supporters of the Trump campaign. They were unnamed in the charge sheet. The deputy attorney general was asked if campaign officials were duped. Now, there is no allegation in this indictment that any American was a knowing participant in this illegal activity. There is no allegation in the indictment that the charge conduct altered the outcome of the 2016 election. The Russian operatives allegedly sought to hurt the candidacy of Trump's challengers, including Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio, and they allegedly aimed to bolster Hillary Clinton's challenger, Bernie Sanders. After the election, special counsel investigators found Russian operatives played both sides. For example, the defendants organized one rally to support the president-elect and another rally to, impose, uh, to oppose him both in New York on the same day. Asked by Fox News whether the Russian government would cooperate in any future prosecution. Have you had any assurances from the Russians that they will provide these individuals for prosecution? No uh, communication with the Russians about this will follow the ordinary process uh, of seeking cooperation and extradition.
Also today, a California man pled guilty to selling bank account numbers to nationals outside the United States between 2014 and 2017. A spokesman for the special counsel said they had no evidence the man was a knowing or winning participant in the Russian plot. In Washington, Catherine Herridge, Fox News. Ed, back to you. Thanks, Catherine. While we don't know what the special counsel has in store when it comes to allegations of Russian collusion, some members of the mainstream media seemed really excited when the initial news of the indictments seemed to be a big problem for the president. But then when the deputy attorney general came out for that news conference and poured cold water on the idea that it actually impacted the election, the media seemed to turn. We have this piece of it, lots of new detail, but we don't have the full scope, uh, so it's unclear how Rosenstein can say that. Unclear to me how he feels like he can draw that conclusion right. based on this kind of, of interference, but that's certainly something that's going to resonate with the president because he has viewed these Russia investigations as a way to undermine his victory from day one. So, for more, let's bring in co-host of the Five, Juan Williams, and editorial director of The Daily Caller. Vince Colonnais. Good to see you both. Juan, it seemed like a lot of your buddies in the media were dying for the Deputy Attorney General to come out and say, the president did it, there was collusion, and this means every, everything's going down. Instead, the Deputy Attorney General said, this didn't impact the election. Well, first of all, the documents, what was presented by the special counsel, did not, would not have substantiated uh, anybody on the left saying, oh, there's evidence of collusion here. There's, there's no such evidence in this indictment. Mm -hmm. What we have is an indictment of Russians for interfering in the election. Mm -hmm. And on that basis, I think the left can say legitimately that President Trump, who has said that nothing happened, fake news, it's a hoax, it's just being perpetrated by people who want to delegitimize my election, mm -hmm. uh, clearly is wrong. We now have the intelligence community and the special counsel say the Russians interfered in the 2016 election. This, so, that's, I'm sorry, but that's the centerpiece, I think, of sort of an, uh, an intellectually dishonest take that the press has had at large today, which is there's no distinction between the way the president treats the notion of a hoax, right? The, he said hoax. What he's referring to and what he has referred to consistently is the notion that they are the reason he won the election and that he colluded. He, he's alleged throughout all of this that that's a hoax. Russia's involvement? He and the White House have accepted that multiple times. I don't but think since so. the intelligence I don't community. Think so. But hang on, Vince. When Vladimir Putin told the president yeah. face to face, I didn't interfere. The president came out and told the press. President Trump said, "I take him at his word." He, he well, he and I can't. I don't have the, the verbiage in front of me. But even but reading you know that language, even reading that language, you're right. No, there's no reason for him to wander on things like this. But the White House at this point and the president have said multiple times since his election that they believe Russia was involved in 2016. And look at Adam Schiff. His statement today. He says, and Adam Schiff has been a fierce critic of the president, a Democrat who says, quote, the indictment leaves open the vital question of whether Americans, including any associated with the Trump campaign, knowingly played a role in Russia's active measures campaign. It leaves that wide open. One. I agree. Meaning, yes, Robert Mueller could still come out with more. Obviously, the investigation. But not open, now. But not in this. Yet. No. So not in this document. Now, I think we also have another point. Vince and I are certainly going to clash on this, which is, when you hear Rod Rosenstein say it didn't influence the outcome of the election, mm -hmm. my, to my mind, he's saying, well, there's no clear indication that they were able to get involved with machinery, the voting machines, mm -hmm. or yeah. to interfere with the voter rolls. The results. But propaganda has tremendous impact Not on much, though. I had opinion. people sending me notes on social media today saying, if, you, if your vote in this election, Vince, was decided by a post on Facebook, Basically, you're an idiot. I mean, don't, I mean, shouldn't you make up your own mind? Is a Facebook post by the Russians or anyone else really going to turn your vote? No, because here's why. Because this, because sociologists who've actually taken some time to look at this since the election, the, the, right. the, that investigation notwithstanding, the New York Times published this very week, on February 13th of this week, declared that there was little impact on the election of this type of conversation. Juan, I want to make another point, which is that you believe the president of the United States should do something about Russian interference in an American election, right? Well, big time, because we're coming up on the midterms. And, right. And all indications we heard from not only uh, Christopher Wray, but we've heard from the director of national intelligence, uh, Dan Coates, uh -huh. that the Russians not only are continuing right now, sure. but they plan to, in fact, increase, that they are, we are at cyber war, so, un under attack, cyber warfare attack from the Russians. Right. But my point is, I wanted to lead you into... 
okay. an American president, this president, you want him to do something. Why didn't the last American president, according to this indictment, it started in 2014 under Barack Obama. What did they do? You know, I don't think they did enough, and I, I'm not the only one. I think you, if you had a group of Democrats, left-wing people, especially people who were involved in the Hillary mm -hmm. Clinton campaign, they'd be very damning of the lack of action taken by the Obama folks. But now the Obama team says they couldn't do more without appearing to be taking but sides in the election. Work. But the Clinton campaign has its own problems on its hand because it has Russian informants animating an opposition research document oh, come on. that was handed over to the government that, and used as a pretext. Well, hang on. You American don't want foreign citizen. influence in an election, but it's okay for Christopher Steele to come up with a dossier. Christopher Steele is working for an American, American company. He's a British. He's working British for an American company, Fusion GPS, uh -huh. and doing research. Who's that money? was it. Whose money did he Well, get? first it was conservative money, no, and it then it was. Right. Yes, Christopher it was. Steele never got money from I, no, but I'm saying that they, Fusion GPS was given money to create a dossier on Donald Trump by conservatives and then later by the yes. Clinton Guys, campaign. we're just getting fired up. We've got a whole <laughs> hour. The two of us could light up Friday In night. In the meantime, you two have a good weekend. we got a lot <laughs> more you. news. The White House tonight Thank claiming you. the media is guilty again of some fake news. After a report in The New Yorker claiming then-businessman Donald Trump had a sexual relationship with former Playboy Playmate of the Year, Karen McDougal. According to the report, the two met in 2006, not long after his marriage to his current wife, Melania. President Trump denies any relationship with the former playmate. Meanwhile, White House Chief of Staff John Kelly tonight unveiling an overhaul of security clearance procedures in the wake of sharp criticism over his response to the Rob Porter debacle. Kelly, who has faced tough questions over how Porter continued to work as a Trump official despite allegations he abused two previous wives, agreed to changes that put the burden on the FBI and the Justice Department to provide more information, plus some big updates to security clearances. Coming up, our own legal inventor is digging into the latest problems at the FBI. What's behind the string of alleged failures in political bias? And have the miscues vindicated the president in his attacks on the Bureau? That's next. We just heard about the FBI's mishandling of information that could have maybe prevented the tragic shooting this week in Florida. This most recent blunder has the agency caught, of course, in the crosshairs. The president took a lot of heat for challenging the bureau, but is he getting some measure of vindication now as we see these problems? Correspondent Leland Vitter is looking into it. He joins us live now. Good to see you, Leland. Ed, good to see you as well. Breaking tonight, the Senate Judiciary Committee chairman wants a briefing for its staff on how the FBI missed so much about Nicholas Cruz. In the past, the president parses no words in talking about the FBI and the DOJ. This month, calling them disgraceful and saying they should be ashamed. From the New York Times, Trump's unparalleled war on a pillar of society, law enforcement, writing the war between the president and the national law enforcement apparatus is unlike anything America has seen in modern times. There is, of course, the political war by the president, but there is also the public relations war by the Bureau about its own reputation as the world's premier law enforcement and investigative agency. In fact, as we look back at the most searing terror and other attacks in recent memory, it's harder to find suspects that weren't on the FBI radar than those who were. The Boston Marathon bombers, the FBI did interviews, but found no link or nexus to terrorism. The Orlando Pulse nightclub shooter, the FBI investigated, but said they couldn't find anything illegal. The Charleston, South Carolina church shooting in April 2015, well, the FBI missed a police report from a prior incident. The Fort Hood terrorist. The FBI conducted only a cursory investigation into evidence that the radicalized American-born Muslim was frequently contacting an al-Qaeda-affiliated terrorist overseas before killing so many at Fort Hood. The Fort Lauderdale airport attack. The gunman in this case went to the FBI's office in Alaska complaining that voices in his head were telling him to follow ISIS. They did nothing. The Texas church shooter fell through the cracks of the DOD and FBI databases, allowing him to purchase weapons despite domestic violence issues. As for the failures in tracking down the tip that could have prevented the Parkland shooting, the FBI director today said, we are still investigating the facts. I am committed to getting to the bottom of what happened in this particular matter, as well as reviewing our processes for responding to information that we receive from the public it's up to all Americans to be vigilant, and when members of the public contact us with concerns, we must act properly and quickly. On the website, the FBI notes it gets literally thousands of tips a day, 
Ed, underscoring back to the story you covered, which was the Boston Marathon bombing and President Obama's response in defense of the Bureau after their miss on the Boston Marathon bombing, uh, President Obama said, this is hard stuff. Yeah, and, and fair point, because, you know, the FBI gets a lot right as well. They protect us. They make mistakes, but they're human, but they also protect us. It's a balance here. Yeah. But this mistake, boy, is they will, is 17 they would, dead. Is they, is they, deadly consequences. But as they will tell you, the bad guys only have to be right once. Mm -hmm. They have to be right 100% of the time. It's a high bar. Good information, Leland. Appreciate it. In the wake of the FBI admitting they failed to follow protocol regarding information on the Florida shooter, Governor Rick Scott called for the FBI director's resignation today. Does this fit in with the GOP versus the FBI narrative, or is there something else going on here now? Joining me live, the White House correspondent for the Washington Examiner, Sarah Westwood, and constitutional attorney Ed Pazwali. Good to talk to you both. Uh, and as you just heard from Leland, look, um, all kinds of mistakes. As I said, they're human. Uh, but I thought Jonathan Turley, a little earlier tonight on special reports, said something that is so important. Take a listen to this. You can't tell people see something, say something if the next line is do nothing. You know, right. it's it's it really undermines what the FBI has been working for years to try to get people to do. So there has to be some accountability here and some really explanation. Ed, you know, see something, say something. You say something, they do nothing. Yeah, saying something means that you took the time and courage to say something and then nothing is done. And so, Ed, I'll tell you, I, I grew up in that community. I went to high school in that community. My kids graduated from a neighboring high school just recently. And I got to tell you, that community is devastated and they will let down. What does failure of FBI protocol mean, particularly to a parent mm -hmm. who simply sent their child to school that morning and they didn't return? Sarah, you heard some of the headlines. Leland was talking about the New York Times. There's a couple more I want to point out. New York Times uh, had this story recently. Trump's unparalleled war on a pillar of society, law enforcement, Vox, unprecedented. Nine historians on why Trump's war with the FBI is so stunning. And The Guardian, Trump's attack on the FBI is an attack on the U.S. Constitution itself, on the Constitution itself, Sarah. I mean, look, the president needs to be fair and he needs to be balanced in how he, you know, go, goes after and demands accountability from the FBI or anyone else. But what's wrong with asking questions of agencies that clearly are not perfect here? Exactly. And President Trump has never attacked the FBI as a whole. And in fact, he and his allies in the White House have been careful to specify that what they're criticizing about the FBI is political leadership that's left over from the previous administration, and particularly everyone uh, affiliated with former FBI Director James Comey. They've never criticized the rank and file men and women of the FBI who keep the bureau running, who keep people safe. And they've been clear that, in fact, they want to defend those men and women. It's Democrats who have extrapolated the White House his skepticism of the political leadership yeah. of the FBI to make it an attack on the whole bureau so that they can you have know, this straw man argument. Ed, I, I think Sarah makes a good point to bring James Comey into this. Christopher Wray is in the hot seat right now, and rightly so. He's the FBI director, but he's new to the job. If there are major problems at the FBI, it turns out that this guy who's been holding himself up to be this high prince of everything, James Comey, he was running that bureau for about a decade. So what in the world was going on there? Well, clearly they failed here, and, and the, the community, this community will never be the same, Ed, and that's a real problem. They need to do a quick process review, and people need to be held accountable, and whether it's James Comey or Ray or the underlying theme of some of the other people involved in this process, but this cannot happen on a regular basis. We do a lot of things well. Uh, FBI does a lot of things well, but the bottom line is the major failure here caused 17 deaths. Sarah, final point, and that, that is just so tragic, obviously. Um, the fact as well, you hear Democrats like Philippe Reines, I saw on social media today, uh, saying, I bet you he's predicting that the president is going to use this miscue as a pretext to fire Christopher Wray, who he nominated, as a way of getting him out of Russia and the other investigations. Is this just more of Democrats trying to start trouble? They said he's going to fire Mueller. He's going to fire Rosenstein. He hasn't fired any of them. 
Right. We haven't seen the president calling for Ray's resignation yet. In fact, the only senior member of the FBI that we have heard President Trump criticize recently, Andrew McCabe, was reportedly removed for cause. And even though Governor Rick Scott is calling for Ray's resignation and ostensibly Trump's interests right now would dovetail with that if mm. he wanted Ray out for Russia, we haven't seen the White House echoes those calls for Ray's removal. So there's no evidence that that's the path President Trump is going to take right now. All right. A lot of big issues uh, confronting the FBI right now. Sarah, Ed, appreciate you both coming in. Thank you. Meanwhile, Supreme Court justices meeting behind closed doors. Could they take up the dispute on Dreamers and DACA? And one of the largest immigration sweeps in Southern California. The federal crackdown continues on the sanctuary state. Plus, a smartphone American officials say you should stay away from. Details ahead. On New Year's Day, California's status as a sanctuary state was basically codified into law. This week, Immigration and Customs Enforcement agents apparently responded yet again with one of the largest enforcement actions in years in and around L.A. Trace Gallagher has a story in depth tonight. And there was certainly nothing random about this crackdown by Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE. They were sending a clear message to California as a sanctuary state and Los Angeles as a sanctuary city that businesses still have to follow federal law and verify their employees are in this country legally. In fact, this was among the biggest enforcement efforts in years against local businesses. In the end, ICE arrested 212 illegal immigrants and served notices of audit to 122 businesses, meaning those companies will now have to prove they're not hiring illegals. ICE does say that almost 90% of those arrested are convicted criminals, which follows their policy of focusing on illegals who commit crimes. Remember, being a sanctuary city means that Los Angeles does not cooperate with immigration agents when it comes to handing over jail inmates for deportation. ICE says if the city won't give them up, agents have to go out and get them, saying, quoting, fewer jail arrests mean more arrests on the street and that also requires more resources which is why we are forced to send additional resources to those areas to meet operational needs and officer safety some of those arrested will be prosecuted for illegal entry or re-entry after being deported and others will simply be deported the last time ice conducted a business crackdown in january seventeen liberal lawmakers in congress signed a letter objecting to the enforcement writing quote ice officers have a mission to promote homeland security and public safety not to act as an arm of the government designed to intimidate and harass business owners their employees and their patrons and certainly not use raids as a threat of what's to come i says unlike the state of california it has no plans to stop enforcing the law ed Now for Where in the World, some quick hits from all around the globe. The Miami Herald reporting tonight nearly half of Puerto Rico's housing was built illegally, and then came Hurricane Maria last September. The island's building codes are said to be on par with Florida's windstorm rules, but the Herald reports that as many as half of Puerto Rico's dwellings, up to a million, were built without any permits of any kind. The island clearly still struggling to recover, meanwhile, from Maria. Top officials from the CIA, NSA, FBI, and the Defense Intelligence Agency all agree Americans should not buy smartphones made by Chinese tech companies Huawei or ZTE. Testifying before the Senate Intel panel, the Intel experts said the smartphone makers pose a security threat to U.S. customers. The companies dispute that, and supporters are rushing to their defense tonight, saying the U.S. spy agencies are just trying to protect domestic brands like Apple's iPhone. An international aid group says it's taken action on 24 cases of sexual harassment or abuse among employees last year and dismissed 19 people. MSF is also known as Doctors Without Borders. The statement came as British-based aid organization Oxfam faces widespread criticism after allegations surfaced that Oxfam staff paid for sex while working in Haiti after the 2010 earthquake. El Salvador Supreme Court commuting the sentence of a woman serving 30 years in prison for getting an abortion. She says it was actually a stillbirth. The court ruled that the evidence in the case did not prove she took any specific action to abort the pregnancy, which is illegal in El Salvador, and thus was eligible for a form of clemency. El Salvador is one of four Latin American countries with total complete bans on abortion. 
A sophisticated plot to wage information warfare against the U.S.? That's how officials are characterizing the efforts of those 13 Russian nationals indicted today for interfering in the 2016 election. Up next, we'll talk to an actual cybersecurity expert to learn whether this was really a sophisticated operation or something like the Merry Pranksters. We'll explain next. And he says Washington has a lot to learn from Utah while taking a swipe yes at President Trump over immigration. Mitt Romney is back. He announces a run for Senate. Is he about to become a big thorn in the president's side? The indictment of 13 Russians revealed today by the Justice Department talks about an operation that was able to organize a couple of pro and anti-Trump rallies after the election during the presidential transition. They created internet memes called Blacktivists, Woke Blacks, United Muslims of America, Army of Jesus, Trumpsters United, and Clinton Fraudation. Another meme, I am ass. Hmm, wonder why that, that didn't work out. <laughs> Reportedly petered out in 2014, shockingly. Then the accused Russian hackers put a sign in somebody's hands in front of the White House that said, Happy birthday, dear boss, directed at a Russian oligarch back home. All that on a budget of, yes, a million bucks. Now, the Russians ran into trouble two months before the election. According to an email by one of the alleged conspirators, quote, we had a slight crisis here at work. The FBI busted our activity. Not a joke. Media, though, taking this very seriously. The AP quoting experts like Melissa Ryan, described as a Democratic social media marketing expert who reportedly keeps track of right-wing online activity, quote, the idea was not necessarily to help one political party over another, but to sow as much discord as possible. This was America that was attacked. David Gersoff Richard, a communications professor at Emerson College, told the AP, this is the new norm. It's not going away. Perhaps true. But was this really a sophisticated attack or something a little wacky? Let's get a reality check from renowned cybersecurity expert Morgan Wright. Morgan, I, I hear some of those groups and the memes. Yes. It sounds like the Keystone Cops. Keystone Cops have created now a special counsel investigation of congressional investigations, have turned Facebook, Twitter, off social media on its head by making them testify in front of They're Congress. They're on defense now. Yeah, so I don't think it's a Keystone Cops operation. I actually had a chance to talk with Ambassador Woolsey, and we were talking about this kind of has a lot of the hallmarks of Russian intelligence The former operation. CIA director, James former Woolsey. CIA, absolutely. And this is all, this, I mean, this was a very sophisticated operation. Think about this, 14 people, they may, people may say it didn't have an effect, but it had its intended effect because what are we still talking about a year after the election? Yeah, well, we're talking about it tonight. Your Absolutely. point is, is well taken. I don't want to completely dismiss it, but I do want to put it in a broader context. So a million dollars spent. And again, Robert Mueller is still investigating. So he may find out that there was a whole lot more spent, and, right. and we'll see. But a million dollars is what we've found so far. I checked the numbers. In 2016, you know how much was spent on the elections? 6.5 billion, billion, you're right with a B, 2.4 for the White House when you include Republican Democratic primaries, right. the general election, about $4 billion for the House and Senate races. Yeah. $6.5 billion. These guys spent a million. So was this minor in context? Or on the other hand, to your point, out of $6.5 billion, they spent a million and, w and they didn't throw the election, according to the Deputy Attorney General. They had an impact. Well, they had an impact because we know now, too, they were in some of the election databases. So they wouldn't have had to alter any of the election. They would have just had to put into doubt one of the databases, one of the vote results, in, say, a key county in Ohio, which is always a swing state or some important county. And if you can throw one county into uh, question into suspicion, then you have to worry about all the other results. So the integrity of the entire process, the integrity of the voting, and they accomplished that. Then not only did they, but hang on, they uh, pitted people against each other. Wait, but, but I want to go back to the integrity of the vote. Uh, you seem to be suggesting they could have had an impact on the integrity of the vote. In fact, we have no evidence, though. No, no, what I'm saying is okay. that because we know now that they were inside some of these databases, uh -huh. they didn't affect anything. But what I'm saying, had they chose to do that. Had they. Had they. And that, that might have been a bridge too far because now we're going from influence to interference. And that gets into sovereignty issues. So I don't know if the Russians are really ready to take that kind of swing at the United States yet and actually interfere in our elections. But this is as close as it comes without flipping a vote. You somewhere. raised something that touches a lot of our viewers' lives, which is social media, and yes. Facebook and Twitter. So what should people be looking out for? How much more skeptical should our viewers be? How, what, what can they do? Yeah, you know, go back to, uh, it was Edgar Allan Poe who said one time, he said, believe nothing that you hear and only half of that you see. Mm -hmm. Take it with a grain of salt. Look, social media is not 
the be all to end all. It is not the silver bullet of truth. We've lost. How do we vote in elections back in the 50s or the 60s? People actually had discussions. We did things. You know, you, you've got to quit relying on social media because as we've seen in so many, everything from Florida mm -hmm. to some of the other attacks, social media has played a disparate role in the influence and we give it too much influence. And also, I got 30 seconds, but did it really have that much impact? I mentioned in an earlier segment, I had people on social media on both sides, by the yes. way, tell me, I voted for Donald Trump because of the economy and this, it had nothing to do with some Russian Facebook post. And I voted for Hillary Clinton because I wanted her to be the first female president and I don't like Donald Trump. If you're basing your vote on Facebook, you got an issue, don't yeah, you? Yeah, you got a bigger problem than that. Yeah, it's like if and if Facebook and Twitter goes down, oh my God, you know, the world's What am I going to do? It. Yeah, I'll tell you what it really boils down to. This is also a test run, so we've got to worry about the 2018 uh -huh. and the 2020 the elections coming up. Because you know what they did? They've learned a lot of lessons out of this, lessons and mistakes that they will not repeat in the upcoming elections. Morgan, thanks for bringing us some facts and separating out the fiction. <laughs> you better. Have a good weekend. Staunch Hillary Clinton supporter says the economy is better off under Trump than it would have been under Clinton. A Clinton supporter is saying that. Why isn't the media talking about it? Plus, we'll take a close look at a rocky road on the markets and what to expect next week. That's coming up. A staunch Hillary Clinton supporter, the CEO of Goldman Sachs, says the economy is better off under Donald Trump. Lloyd Blankfein saying if the president didn't win, and Hillary Clinton won, bet you the economy is higher today than it otherwise would be. Despite market volatility recently, stocks rose for the sixth straight day. Joining me now to discuss Hoover Fellow and former policy director for Mitt Romney, Lonnie Chen. So Blankfein said he hasn't felt this good since 2006, but to be fair, he added the odds of a bad outcome have gone up. So explain this kind of confusing split in the economy right now. Even Lloyd Blankfein is saying, I was a Clinton supporter, but I think Trump's done better on the economy, but I'm still kind of worried. Well, look, where we are right now is that the tax cut bill is the great undercover story. Really, people have not talked about the impacts of this bill. But what it's done, really, is it's boosted economic growth. You've got people that have more economic optimism. And the one thing President Trump has done, there's no question in my mind he's done better than Hillary Clinton would ever have been able to do, mm -hmm. is to be a cheerleader for the economy. And so much of our economy and so much about the performance of our economy is about whether people feel good about it. Sure. Now, I think the reason people are a little concerned is what happens when the impact of the tax bill starts to wear off? What happens when inflation starts to creep up? Right. I think those Does are the worries. Does it get worries. too good? So inflation Does it get goes too up. Good? Interest rates go up. Exactly. And, and, and that puts pressure potentially on the stock market, and it puts pressure on some other economic measures. All right, let's get to uh, some of the other uh, hot issues. We talked about Mitt Romney used to work for him. Yeah. Uh, he announced today, made it official. He's getting into the Senate race. Let's take a look at something uh, that Barack Obama said about him in 2012. A few months ago, when you were asked what's the biggest geopolitical threat facing America, you said Russia. Not Al-Qaeda. You said Russia. In the 1980s or now, calling to ask for their foreign policy back because, you know, the Cold War's been over for 20 years. Uh, the Cold War's been over. They, you know, Russia wasn't a big deal in 2012. When you look at the headlines today, Democrats certainly seem like Russia's a big deal. Well, and I think they, uh, you know, keep saying that over and over again. I wish we could just let that clip uh, replay over and over again to remind people just how wrong President Obama was and how prescient Mitt Romney was, how, how he was able to say, look, Russia is a threat. They continue to be a threat. And if anything, today's news tells us that Russia was, in fact, trying to infiltrate the American system of democracy. And maybe the Obama administration didn't do enough. During the Obama administration, during the time when President Obama was in office, this is when all this activity started, when but, Russia began to infiltrate our elections. Sure. But now, on the other hand, let's look forward. Mitt Romney was the Republican presidential nominee. We just made that point. But now he's really taking on the president on a whole range of issues, particularly immigration. Is he going to, if he wins, is he going to come to the Senate and just be an independent minded senator or is he just going to be a scorch? You know, is he going to be a nudge? Is he going to be just poking at President Trump all the time and further dividing Republicans? You know, Ed, I, I don't think he's going to the Senate to be the, the, the anti Trump. He's not going there to poke at the president all the mm -hmm. time. There's going to be lots of situations where Mitt Romney and the president are going to agree. And in those situations, he's going to do everything he can to move the ball forward on the conservative agenda. There will be times he's going to disagree. Mm -hmm. And I think when they do disagree, he's not going to hesitate to express that disagreement. Right. I think that's going to be a really and good thing. The media thing. will highlight it. We oh, can bet yeah. On that. But you know what? That's, right. that, that's part of this. Lonnie Chen, we appreciate you coming in. Thanks, Ed. A salute to a crooner. Up next, I'll share some personal stories about a dear friend we lost this week and the man Frank Sinatra said had the best pipes in the business.